So this is a very interesting myth, and there's a lot in this myth. Um, the scholar that Aidan mentioned, uh, Joseph Campbell, in his uh, book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, he talks about this uh, uh, myth briefly, and he says, he describes it as a hero myth, and he talks about the, the goddess. And another Irish author, Anthony Murphy, who has written about uh, Irish mythology, describes one of the meanings of this myth, of the culture, which is in the story is the, it's the name Irish word for the hag. And he says about this myth, he says, it is the dying of the old self, the old belief, the old system that you have carried with you. It is the preconditioning that you have brought through your life that has prevented you from emerging through, from this threshold, emerging into a newer life and a newer state of being and consciousness. So what the myth is describing is that Nile, to take on this responsibility of kingship, he has to let go of his old way of being, his old way of, of life, to embrace this responsibility. And if he's not ready or he's unwilling to take on the responsibility of kingship, of leading, well, then this, the responsibility, responsibility looks hideous. It looks awful. It looks ugly. It looks repulsive. But if he accepts to... Um, if he, if he accepts to accept the responsibility, then to, um, it starts to reveal beauty. It starts to reveal that the responsibility he's took on has a certain inner beauty to it. And the hag in the story is not external, but it's internal. It's internal inside ourselves. So there's a lot more we can say about the myth um, of the hero um, in these myths, but they're the main things for, uh, I can extract for Irish kingship. Two are, uh, we can see at the moment, this, the king was without blemish. Obviously, nobody's without blemish. We all have, none of us are perfect. But that's not the, the, um, the point. It's that we work at, constantly work at trying to become better. I think that's what I, one of the messages in the myth. The other uh, aspect of dimension I want to look at is uh, kingship and the wisdom texts and the law texts. And they give a, a different, uh, different dimension to, to, to kingship. And in some traditions in the, in the continent, kingship is associated with absolute power. But in Irish kingship, uh, the, uh, the Irish kingship was an office of responsibility and limitation. The, the king didn't have absolute power. And in Fergus uh, Kelly's book, uh, A Guide to Early Irish, Early Irish Law, he describes the nature of the king and the tuat, which means the people, the relation between the king and, and his, and his tuat, describes it as more uh, a relationship of rights and responsibility for both sides. And the king was not above the law. In general, the words of the law text suggests that the king observed the law like everybody else in the tuat, within the, the, within the people. The king had no legislative authority and he could not make laws. And scholars' uh, opinion uh, differs. Opinions differ on this, but that's what they, they generally say. Another. So Monica is going to talk about Breton laws after after me. So she'll explain it much more in depth. The other dimension is a text called uh, the Testament of Moran, and it was a, a, a text that was uh, recorded on the seventh century in seventh century. And it's, a, it's advice given by a judge to a young king. And it stresses the importance of justice in bringing about peace and stability. And the text says, I'll just read it out. Let him keep my advice, which follows here. Let him preserve truth, it shall preserve him. Let him uh, raise truth, it will raise him. Let him exalt mercy, it exalts him. Let him care for the tribe, they will care for him. Let him help the tribes, they will help him. Let him soothe his tribes, they will soothe him. Tell him it is true the truth of the ruler that plagues and great lightning are kept from the people. It is true the truth of the rulers that he secures peace, tranquility, joy, ease, and comfort. So what's interesting in this text is that what's important is the character of the, the king. It's not how much the king uh, has, how much wealth, power, how much, um, how, what image he presents to its people. But fundamentally, it's based on the character. 
And if the character of the king is, um, is unjust, then what happens to the, the, the to it or the kingdom, it enters into a wasteland. And this the theme of a wasteland is uh, very uh, popular in Celtic mythology where the whole kingdom, the people, the crops fail because the, the, to it, the king was the person who was able to connect with the law, the principles, and was an example and, sh and was an example to others in the, king in the kingdom. Also, it explains that there is a relationship between the people and the king. It's not something separated, disconnected, but there was a fundamental interconnectivity between uh, the, the connectivity. And one thing that they, they mentioned in this text that's very important is called the prince's truth. And the Irish word is for flahamon. So this concept that the uh, king was to uphold the prince's truth. Another word for that is justice. And this is a concept that we see uh, through many civilizations. In ancient Egypt, they call it Mat. In, in India, they call it Dharma. The ancient Greeks call it Daiki. And it was the, the idea that there exist timeless principles and values. And the king was that person who was able to connect to it, was inspired by it, but was all, also able to connect to it. And that's something I'm going to talk about in a few minutes about this idea of the sacral king. The text in the text it continues that it describes four types of uh, kings or rulers. The, the four types of, are the true ruler, the reasoning ruler, the ruler of occupation, and the bull ruler. And I'm just going to read out a description for the text which what that describes each ruler. So the true ruler is the first in the first place is moved towards every good thing. He smiles on truth when he hears it. He exalts it when he sees it, for he, for he, he whom the living do not glorify with bless, blessing is not a true ruler. The second one is the reasoning ruler, defends borders and to it, they yield their valuables and Jews to him. The ruler of occupation, next one, the wider ruler defends borders and tribes, they yield their valuables and Jews to him. And the last one is the, the bull ruler. Strikes and is struck, wards off and is warded off, roots out and is rooted out, attacks, attacks and is attacked, pursued and is uh, um, pursued, pursues and is pursued. Against this, there is always bellowing and horns. So this is very ins insightful because it describes that there are different natures of, within the human being and that not everyone is suitable to rule because of the due to their state of consciousness. If you remember the story of Nine and the Nine Hostages, when he, in the hero myth, through his actions, it, it, they discovered, the Drew discovered his true nature. And through his, um, his responses to the challenges, discovered that uh, he was able to rule, first to rule himself and uh, to rule the others. And so it discovered the myth shows this, um, this, um, this, this is very interesting. Um, Plato in the Republic describes these different types of natures of rulers as well, and so in India. So it's very interesting when you compare these myths and these texts to across the world, they're all saying similar things. The last thing is uh, about the, the text is talking about the sacral king, which I mentioned. And it describes that the king symbolically um, married the goddess or the uh, sovereign of Ireland, Atara. And the goddess is someone who was uh, lived in the other world, in that side of life that we can't weigh, we can't measure, we can't light, uh, touch, but they say that exists. Um, and it, it was an invisible realm, the sh as she is even mentioned. And what does that mean? What does it mean that the, the king um, married this goddess? Symbolically, it means that the, um, the person, the king, is able to connect with the timeless dimension of life, timeless ideas, timeless principles, and is able to inspire himself or himself to connect to it. And in that relationship, is able to transmit that in his actions. And uh, in the book, Early Irish Kingship and Succession by Bart Jeske, he explains this, this um, mystical marriage 
that well, then there was a ritual in Tara where this happened. So that's, uh, that's, one, that's the second dimension of kingship. And the last one I want to talk about is kingship and history. And Aidan talked a little bit about um, how the myths were passed on in ancient uh, medieval Ireland. And the history of Ireland uh, was passed on in an oral tradition for how long, we don't know. But around the fifth, uh, fifth century, Christianity emerged in, in Ireland. And then uh, different monastic communities started to, to form. And they started to write down the, the myths they collected. And they also started to write down the history in the annals, nearly year by year, what, what happened in, the, in Ireland. Always, it was always kind of a, it was not a totally objective recording of history. It was always influenced by difficult uh, kings to suit themselves. But it gives us an idea of what happened in Ireland. And also uh, some of the myths that the, the, the Celtic monks recorded, they added elements of uh, Judeo-Christian mythology as well. So if you read uh, the book, uh, the book, uh, sorry, what you call it, the Book of Invasions, you'll see the, there's a mixture there. And the first thing you notice about the history of Ireland is in the fifth century onwards, because that's when history in Ireland started to be recorded, that there was a lot of conflicts. There was a lot of battles. There was a lot of um, conflicts within the Tuat between different provinces. And you may be surprised at that because in the talk so far, I've been talking about these uh, principles of the ideals, justice, the prince's truth. And a way to understanding this is that the myth, these myths, these ideas, values are like, um, are like models to aspire to. And sometimes a nation or a culture is close, very close to them. And sometimes they're further away. And depending where the culture is at, it, it, um, it's reflected in their history. And in medieval Ireland from the start of the fifth century AD onwards, we can see that they're a little bit further away from these ideals. Um, we see that uh, uh, in the, the politics of the country or the political environment, that's not, it's not united. There is, there's a few provincial kings uh, and provinces, and one of the main ones is the, is the Unil dynasty, which is the ascendants of Nile at the Nile hostages. But there's also kings um, in the different provinces, Must, Munster, Connacht, and Leinster. So uh, Francis Bourne in his book, Irish Kings and High Kings, he says that, that Ireland had a political fragmentation, but had a cultural unity. So they shared the same myths, same language. The legal tracts were as, um, very much the same or in common, but their ability to unite um, was a challenge. But was this always the case? Was there a time before recorded history when they were able to unite as a, uh, as a people? In Pontius McCann's book, in The Cult of the Sacred uh, Center, he explores this option, this, this idea, and he, and he argued since the Irish people shared a mythology, shared a culture, shared a, shared a similar tradition, perhaps in the past, um, they were united. Uh, but we just haven't got records for it anymore. In the book Celtic Heritage, um, which looks, uh, which was a comparative study of mythology, anthropology, and symbolism, they explain that the Irish word uh, province means fifth. We, today we know it as four provinces, but the word means fifth. And um, when the four bulg uh, arrived in Ireland in the in the origin myths, they uh, split Ireland into five provinces four provinces we know at the moment, but also the province of Mead, which means middle or center. So in this idea of province, it, it explains that there are different provinces, but at the same time, there was something that connected them. There was this idea of the Mead or the center. And in this center was Tara, which is where the high king of Ireland uh, ruled the different provinces. And in Irish mythology, they, des they describe that there was many um, high kings of Ireland uh, in the past. We have no record, historical record of them, but they're in there in the myths. 
So that all of that suggests that there has been a unity in the past. So, but in saying that, at the same time, if there was a lot of conflict, there was ta there was moments of unity in in, in Ireland, because the the monastic um, community collected a lot of texts that were um, starting or information knowledge that was starting to be lost in Europe at that time, and it, I think there was a book written about that, how the Irish saved civilization. So within moments of uh, decline, there was also pockets of um, light or renaissance. So in conclusion, what can we learn from Irish kingship? Uh, in the figure of the king, uh, it captures a vision of the human being that aspires towards something higher, towards the prince's truth. And the rule of the king wasn't only functional, but symbolically the king entered into a marriage uh, with truth, justice, beauty, to be inspired by it, to live by it, and also to be reflected in his actions, which was an example for the, for the people in the Tuat. And what we see in the, in the political order is one uh, deeply rooted in the relationship between the king and the Tuat, between the people. They were very, very much an interconnection. And they organized themselves around an ideal, around an archetype, um, which we lack today in our world. And it's very interesting to reflect on this. this. In a way, we, in our world today, we have a sense of this ideal. Um, we, 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 we sense it, and we, we want it, but we're not sure how to translate that into, into reality. And that's always been the purpose of philosophy, to bring, um, help us to connect with that in our daily lives, to bring meaning into our, our daily lives. And, and that's why when we look at ancient uh, civilizations like uh, ancient Ireland or medieval Ireland, ancient Ireland, when we look at their myths, when we look at their legal texts their, and uh, uh, wisdom texts, they're very inspirational. And the question is always is how do we translate that into, into practice for today? Because in the world today, we see there's a lot of fragmentation, there's a lot of conflict, a lot of polarization, but what can help bring us together, unite us beyond our differences? What can we connect us um, beyond the temporal, the temporal world? And in ancient Ireland and many different civilizations that describe that ideals help to unite people, which are expressed in their myths and in different forms. So I think I'm nearly out of time. Um, I hope that was of, uh, of interest. You've learned something. Have you any questions? Uh, there's a few uh, elements that are, the legal texts talk about, uh, and some of them talk about it's the, the wealth of the king, but above all, it's about the character of the king. It wasn't only about what it was about the character. And some other legal texts say mainly it's only the character. And there was a group of uh, people uh, within the dynasty that had to be chosen based on their character. Um, and I think from my study is that the, I could be wrong with this, but I think it was the, the two out of the people who eventually had to say in who became uh, king. So it's very much based on, um, which is reflected in what I've talked about, it's very much based on your actions and your, your, your um, the values that you have. It's not, it's not who you know, um, how much money you can give, the publicity. It's a very different system that we have today. That's what it says in the legal text. Now, how, I always, how that actually panned out in real life, I'm, I don't know. I, I haven't seen anything, uh, read anything about that. So any other questions? I heard a little beep there. All right. No, I think that's it. I don't think we have any other questions. So thank you very much. 